Our next call from Chicago. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, Mr. Representative, or Congressman, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to just uh, have you consider this. Uh, it's a little bit of realism. Um, you keep, you said, y'all, that you don't have any idea how long this insurgency is, uh, it'll take to put it down. I think it, you, you have to look at things realistically. What realistically is going to be the result, because this basically was uh, opening up Pandora's box. There are no military solutions, and in the end, after all of this is done, in the end, realistically, and you, you might not like it, but realistically, what's probably is going to happen is there's going to be a Iraq controlled by the Shia who are not going to be one to allow the Sunnis to really be participating. It's going to be a country that's going to be use oppression more than likely, just like Saddam did, to control the, the country. No, no, not really too much different than that. Plus, it's also it's going to be a country that is probably going to be more closely aligned to Iran. The only thing that we, we're going to get out of this deal, really, is just the removal of Saddam Hussein. So you keep saying, well, until we have a victory, there are no a positive solutions to come out of this. And realistically, you know, we might not like it, but that's the realistic outcome of this thing in, Saddam, uh, in uh, Iraq. Okay, Colin, you've made your point. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think he has a valid point about the concerns of what will happen in the future. I don't think that I would subscribe to the theory, which I, I believe I would agree with him, that it's not simply a military solution. I've said that as long as ago as 2003, that what we need is, if in, the, in the military regime change, is becomes over time less important than their economic reconstruction. The actual tangible, palpable benefit to the Iraqi people of this transformational change to liberty. I think that that is one of the aspects that have been most frustrating to people, is that when you saw the insurgency begin to grow, it stemmed predominantly from the absence of economic opportunity, from the absence of a chance to really participate in a government because they imposed the CPA uh, on the people of Iraq. Harry Truman understood this when he did the Marshall Plan, that you have to give them an opportunity to develop their own economies in their own war-torn country in their own hands, in their own hearts and minds, and that it cannot be imposed on above from the United States. This was a mistake that was fundamental to the problems that we have today. Now, as for the future, I'm far more optimistic about it. I come from Detroit. I know a lot of Iraqis. I have a lot of Chaldean friends. I have a lot of Shia friends, Sunni friends. And I think that what is often overlooked is how long that they did live together without killing each other. There was a lot of intermarriage. There's been a lot of interaction. And what's happened is that a lot of the tensions that have been worked through in many ways over time within the society itself, if not within the governmental class, have been exacerbated by this tension, I think, uh, of, of the situation in Iraq. I think we've had outside influences deliberately trying to stoke them, such as al-Qaeda and such as the Iranians. And in the end, I believe that the Iraqi people, the vast majority of whom just want to live an ordinary daily life like everybody else, should be given that opportunity, and we should not rush to conclusions to prejudge what they will do with their freedom once it is securely in their own hands. A Republican represents the 11th District of Michigan. He's serving his third term, and he's a member of the Foreign Affairs and Budget Committee. Our next call comes from Smith Station, Alabama. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm a loyal Republican, and I am. And I support Bush totally. Um, the war has pretty much gotten out of control. But as Rush Limbaugh says constantly, there's this many people killed in Chicago every year, you know. Um, if the Democrats really don't want this war to go on, they should stop it right now. You know, don't put our troops in them. I have a 19-year-old nephew in Iraq right this minute, fresh out of high school. If the Democrats don't want to support them, cut it off and be done with it. Or either support the president and support our country. And I appreciate your time. And Mr. Thad, I'm right with you. Oh. Thank you. Is, she's right. <clears throat> the caller's right. The Democrats have the opportunity right now to end the war, see America leave, see America's defeat proclaimed. And if they do not want to do that, then they have to come up with a rational basis upon which we can proceed. I, I think it comes down to that. As a Republican, I, I'm very well aware of the fact that we do no longer are, have been entrusted with the ability to govern as a majority. I accept that reality. Uh, it is a well-earned minority in many ways. But I don't know that the Democratic Party is yet to determine whether they want to keep campaigning or start governing in this time of national crisis. Who owns this war right now? 
is the it American President people. Bush it's or not, is it it's Congress? not. No, it's the American people. We will. It is an entire American people's. The entire American people's problem. If I say it's a Republican war or a Democratic war, I'm already dividing the country and already ensuring our defeat. I think that those types of individuals who believe that somehow this is a political game where the only consequences will be felt at the ballot box are going to prove that that mindset is incredibly injurious to American interests throughout the world for generations to come. I come from the state that gave us Arthur Vandenberg, who was a Republican senator, that helped lead our party out of isolationism, hand in hand with Harry Truman, to ensure that the United States reached into the 20th century with the stature and the purpose that it needed. I do not want to see this continue on a partisan basis. Durham, New York. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Two questions that I, I would hope for uh, genuine answers and not deflections. Uh, question number one. Can you name me one member of Congress who genuinely wants us to lose the war? And number two, uh, will we ever have access to the secret Cheney energy meetings, and do you think there might be discussions of post-Saddam oil in those meetings? Thank you. What does redeploy mean? Redeploy means retreat in the face of the enemy. That's what it means. It's a euphemism for that's what it means. So that's not a deflection. I think the people who are deflecting the issue of what they want to see are the people who use the euphemisms. What is change of course when you are in a stalemate? The change of course as exhibited by the timelines for defeat in July or defeat in October show to me that the people who support that type of policy want the United States to lose. Now we can play games here and think to ourselves that somehow no matter what we do over there we can say that we tied them or whatever. It's not the case. Believe me, the people that are, we are engaging every single day over there in Iraq are going to know very well that if we leave precipitously, they take down that government, the United States will have lost. So that's not a deflection, that's reality. And I would ask the caller to, of those people that he supports to ask them to tell the American people the truth as to what happens. And what about a second question on the Cheney Energy meetings? Uh, this, well, evidently they didn't go too well because gas prices are very high. We'll see what the process does. If uh, the Democrats control Congress, I think you should write Mr. Waxman, who's had no trouble investigating the presidential branch of government right now. Peora, Illinois, on our line for Republicans. You're next. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Go ahead, sir. Okay, I was wondering, since they're always talking about benchmarks for Democrats, is there any benchmarks for our troops that are in Bosnia and Kosovo since President Clinton lied to us that we'd only be there a year, and we're still there? Come on, let's be for real and tell the American people. We are going to be there for a long time, just like every war we've ever been in. We're still like we're still in uh, Korea, we're still in Germany, we're still in Japan, we're still buying the Kosovo, we're still in the Philippines. Be honest, we're going to be there for a long time. And I support this president. I support our troops. I am tired of the Democrats saying they're going to do all this. But they want to just cut the funding off and uh, and line up our soldiers like they did in Vietnam and spit on them when they come home like they did my brother. Thank you. Any response? Yes, yeah, so the question I think that most Americans have is the troop levels that we currently have, the use of, of, of the reservists who have volunteered uh, and have, are doing their duty, the troops that have joined the military voluntarily and are doing their duty, is in what levels are we there, if any. Uh, those are questions that hang out there, and, and the list caller will have an idea, and other people will say that it's something else. I, I sense the frustration of both the Democrats, Republicans, and the independent callers. I go back to the fact that it's been very difficult to get a standard judgment of victory. I go back to the fact that because of an absence of a standard judge, uh, assessment of what victory was, a clear statement, the people then have very di great difficulty determining what the future will hold based upon its attainment or its loss. And so I think that his initial talk about President Clinton in Kosovo, I'm a Republican, but I will give President Clinton credit for at least trying to go in there and stop the ethnic cleansing. I believe that the Dayton Peace Accords and others have helped to bring stability to that region, which the Europeans themselves would not necessarily do. And so while we still have troops there, I would not want to bring them out of there and help to recreate that tinderbox and see human beings uh, start to kill each other again. A caller earlier this morning thought that we will be in Iraq for 30 years. What do you think about that prospect? We could be there for three months if the Democrats don't pass a supplemental bill and the war ends and we lose. 